Greetings. I'm George Ripley, Chair of the Connecticut Militia Heritage Council, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our annual Military History Program. This year we are commemorating the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Ordinarily, this would be a live program with an audience, but as you are well aware, the coronavirus has turned life upside down. To minimize the exposure of those involved in producing this program, we filmed the various segments separately and through the wonderful work of the Connecticut National Guard Public Affairs Office, we have blended them into this presentation. It is now my honor and privilege to introduce the Adjutant General of the State of Connecticut, Major General Francis J. Yvonne, Jr. On behalf of the over 5,000 men and women of the Connecticut Army and Air National Guard, I'd like to welcome you to our program, Remembering World War II, 75 years later. While we're in the midst of combating a dangerous virus that has tested the resilience of all of us over the past few months, it is good that we pause to remember those brave men and women who carried our nation through one of the most perilous times in its history. From the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, through the formal surrender of Japan on September 2, 1945, over 200,000 Connecticut men and women served in the various branches of the armed forces all over the world. Over 5,000 gave their lives in that heroic endeavor. Nine Connecticut residents received the Medal of Honor for their service during World War II, including then Lieutenant Robert B. Nett of New Haven, after whom the Connecticut Military Reservation in Niantic was recently named. I congratulate the Central Connecticut State University Veterans History Project for the excellent work they have done in gathering and preserving 
the oral histories of so many Connecticut residents who bravely served our state and our nation. These firsthand accounts are priceless and will be a valuable resource for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, General Yvonne. My first memories of growing up in Glastonbury, Connecticut in the 1950s are of life in Wells Village, which was built by the federal government in 1942 to house defense workers and was home to many returning World War II veterans and their families. World War II back then was just referred to as the war, and I recall many references to the war when adult, adults got together. Over the years, World War II veterans marched in our Memorial Day parades, and Gold Star mothers were driven in shiny convertibles provided by our local Ford dealer. 75 years later, almost all of the World War II veterans are gone, and it's been many years since the last time I saw a World War II Gold Star mother in a Memorial Day parade. As the years have gone on, memories of World War II have faded, except when revived by books such as The Longest Day, about D-Day, and movies such as Saving Private Ryan. But these provide only snapshots of the war and don't convey the immenseness of the conflict, which included all parts of the world. 26 countries actively participated in the war, resulting in millions of military and civilian deaths. On the front lines of this historic and deadly struggle were young men and women from the U.S. who dropped everything to fight for our nation and our way of life. They and those supporting the war effort at home were aptly described by Tom Brokaw and are now universally known as the greatest generation. Through the wonderful work of the Central Connecticut State University Veterans History Project in partnership with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, we will hear from members of the greatest generation as they share some of their memories of those days long ago when the fate of the world was in their hands. It is now my privilege to introduce the Central Connecticut State University Veterans History Project Supervisors. Stephen Klieger, Executive Director for the Center for Public Policy and Social Research at CCSU, and Carl Antonucci, Library Director for the Elihu Burritt Library at CCSU, to say a few words about the project and to introduce the individuals who have made today's program possible. The National Veterans History Project, housed in the U.S. Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., was created in 2000 when Congress voted unanimously to preserve and archive the oral histories of men and women who have served in any of our country's wars or any civilian who supported the war effort in a significant way. The project collects and preserves the video interviews, photographs, and documents of veterans from World War I through present day. As an archive partner with the Library of Congress, Central Connecticut State University proudly participates in the Veterans History Project. Through a collaboration between the Governor William A. O'Neill Endowed Chair Oral History Project and the L.U. Burritt Library, we focus on the oral histories of Connecticut's veterans by conducting and archiving videotaped interviews, as well as collecting photographs, military documents, field maps, journals, memories, and letters. All content is digitized and preserved on our website, as well as in the Library of Congress. To date, we have over 800 recorded interviews with 434 for World War II alone. The Elio Burritt Library has always been enthusiastic about working with the Governor William A. O'Neill Endowed Chair Oral History Project in order to make the Veterans History Project an enduring success. Under this umbrella, we have two librarians who work as project coordinators for the VHP and handle the interviews and records. Moving forward, their goal is to also promote and increase community engagement with the collection in order to share this treasure trove of Connecticut history 
with CCSU and beyond. And now to share some of this valuable content with all of you, it is my pleasure to introduce Brian Matsky, Reference Instruction and Digital Humanities Librarian, and Jillian Maynard, Reference and Instruction Librarian. They will be sharing excerpts from three Connecticut World War II veterans interviewed for our collection. Edmund G. Klepp served in the U.S. Navy during World War II as a chief warrant officer in the machinist branch aboard the USS Helena. He was stationed at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, when the Japanese attacked, surviving the battle and going on to serve in the Pacific Theater. In the following clip, he details his experience on that morning and his reactions to the tragic day. So everything was going rosy until we got out, got to Pearl Harbor. And uh, uh -huh. after about eight, about a year of gunnery practice, uh, we, of course, Pearl Harbor came along, December 7th. Yeah. Yeah. I had uh, the auxiliary watch, you call it, uh -huh. the four to eight that night on December 6th. Uh -huh. And I came off a watch at a quarter to eight, and I told the mess attendant to just go ahead and clean up. No, I didn't want to eat no breakfast. I had a couple sandwiches in the engine room. Yeah. Uh, and I was going to go ashore and get a milkshake at the Y and good hot, a good hamburg. Yeah. <laughs> so I got into the shower and started soaping down real good. And just about then, the officer of the deck came on a loudspeaker and he shouted, all hands, man your battle stations. Japanese planes are attacking Ford Island. Huh. And then uh, about a few seconds later, the torpedo hit right underneath us. On the Helena? On the Helena, yeah. Well, then the fire came up through all the passageways. And I was lucky to be in the shower soaking wet and that's what saved my life. All I, I felt was a hot blast go by me uh -huh. and out the porthole. But there was another guy, I have his name written down here. He got burnt so bad, he was right in line with the washroom door. Uh -huh. And the fire came in, he was scrubbing clothes in the bucket, you know. When you only had underwear like that, you'd, you'd wash him up in the bucket. Yeah. You wouldn't bother sending him to the laundry. Well, anyway, he was washing in a bucket, and of course, uh, all you have on is a pair of shorts, but his, the rest of his body was bare. The fire hit him in the back so bad, he burnt so bad, within three hours, he was dead. Yeah. And that, that was only six feet away from me. So I, I consider I was lucky to be in the shower soaking wet. Yeah. That saved my life, yeah. yeah. So what <sighs> happened after... So after you got out of the shower, uh, how did you get out of there, out of the ship? Oh, we didn't have to get out. Oh. We closed all the watertight doors as quick as possible uh -huh. and kept the ship afloat. Uh -huh. Yeah, it only went down a little at the bow mm -hmm. because they had all the other watertight doors. And if the water did come in, it only seeped in a little at a time. Uh, after two days, they put us into dry dock, which was right, right close to us. Uh -huh. The tugs, they pushed us in the dry dock, and they took out the, the smashed machinery, the, the turbines, the, the fire room got blasted. All hands in the fire room got killed, and uh -huh. anybody that was in the engine room drinking coffee got killed. Yeah. Uh, How many casualties? Well, 33 in Pearl, in Pearl Harbor, uh -huh. 33 died. Uh -huh. Some got up, shot up on deck by planes that were strafing. And anyway, we, uh, we got, uh, we got the two diesel engines that saved, 
they're hauling it pretty well. One up forward, one in aisle. I have big, big diesel jobs. Uh, yeah. They put out enough generating juice to supply the whole ship. Those were okay, so we started them, and then with three or four minutes, our guns were shooting. Yeah. Shooting at the Japs with aircraft. Uh -huh. And of course, our boilers were making black smoke. We were trying to light off with coal oil. Yeah. And uh, oil don't burn good unless it's 140 or more. So anyway, they got steam up on one boiler. And that kept the Japs away pretty well because we were making so much smoke, we filled the harbor <laughs> with that smoke and that protected a lot of the ships from being bombed. Yeah. I think. Yeah. What was going through your mind uh, when, when all this was happening? Well, you didn't have much time to think. Yeah. You pitied the poor guys that were walking around with skin hanging off their hands and legs, yeah. burnt skin, and they were whimpering, yeah. crying, howling for a, a hospital corpsman, you know, to take care of them, uh -huh. give them a shot of morphine. Uh -huh. Some of the guys were laying on deck already dead, and you couldn't do much for them except pity them. What did you think of Pearl Harbor? How did it look after? I mean, were you, what was going through your mind when you, when you, when you saw the devastation of what the Japanese did? Well, <laughs> you can't think much, but uh, the officers that should have been sending peop planes out on patrol. Uh -huh. Even our radar system wasn't too good, but uh, uh, one of the seamen picked up, he says, a, a whole bunch of dots in the distance about an hour away. He reported it to the lieutenant and he says, oh, forget it. Huh. And uh, they reported it to the head man or head, the head admiral uh -huh. and they disregarded it. So they had plenty of warning. They should have had some planes out patrolling. Yeah. They had these PBYs that go, could go a couple thousand miles and land on the water, too. So, we were caught with our pants down. Yeah. Uh. Colonel John Higgins enlisted in the Connecticut Army National Guard prior to World War II and was assigned to the 169th Infantry Regiment when his unit was called into active federal service on 24 February, 1941. He became acclimated to military life by serving in the Civilian Conservation Corps for 15 months, where his weapons were a pick and shovel rather than a rifle. In this segment, we follow the movement of the 169th Infantry Regiment from San Francisco on October 1st, 1942, to New Zealand and on to the Solomon Islands as part of the Solomon Islands campaign. Colonel Higgins provides a soldier's eye view of life in the 169th during this period. And I shipped overseas out of San Francisco from Fort Ord. And that was on, uh, it was shipped out on the 1st of October, uh, 1942. And uh, we, we, uh, land, we got onto, in Frisco, we loaded onto a Dutch, uh, uh, liner that was converted to troop uh, carrying, and um, we had, we had, were 22 days at sea and landed in Auckland, New Zealand, where uh, we had all we had to uh, unload all the equipment off the ship, and everything in Frisco was loaded like a commercial basis. When we got to New Zealand, the, the trucks and the artillery and, the, and the, all the vehicles uh, were in crates. So the, uh, the entire division maintenance people were all put in one camp and they put all these vehicles back together again. And, and when we left, uh, we only stayed in New Zealand for about one month. And uh, my unit was located in a small town called Walkworth 
which was north of Auckland, uh, New Zealand. We uh, loaded uh, uh, in a combat fashion on uh, ships in uh, Auckland Harbor and went to New Caledonia where we made a, a landing off the side of the ship. And uh, I'd just like to mention that uh, in my 37 months overseas, the only time I ever got on a ship through to a gangplank was when I got on in Frisco and off in uh, New Zealand. And after that, every time we went to an island, we went over the side of the ship, down the nets, and into the small boats. And that was quite interesting when you, with the low, the small boat going up and down, and the big ship moving slightly too. So as you went down the side of the nets, you had to be very careful because we were full with the uh, full equipment on us, the rifles, ammo, everything pack and down the side we went. But uh, we stayed in uh, New Caledonia, which was a French uh, island, for about uh, just about two months. And then we loaded uh, in uh, Numia Harbor, which is the capital of New Caledonia, and we went to Guadalcanal. And uh, we landed in Guadalcanal around the 1st of January, 43. And we got into the tail end of the fighting in Guadalcanal, but most of our time there was spent on patrolling. And uh, in fact, most of the Japs we saw were dead ones killed by the units ahead of us. And uh, we only stayed in Guadalcanal for a little bit less than a month. And uh, then we reloaded onto ships and we moved up to uh, some islands called the Russells. And our there were, there were several, there were two medium-sized islands and a few smaller ones. And uh, we were there for about four months. And then we loaded again uh, and uh, made the invasion in the, in the northern Solomons on the island of New Georgia. And, and New Georgia was our first real combat uh, situation, and it was one tough situation. Most people who haven't been out in the islands, they have no idea, they think they're tropical paradises. Yeah. And it's absolutely not like that because of the heat. Rained all the time. We were always wet. We had to live in foxholes. Uh, so people were shooting at us. And while I was in, uh, in uh, we moved from uh, the island of Rendova, where we first landed, we moved over to New Georgia where the fighting was. We, uh, we had a, uh, a mission to take uh, through the jungles, about six miles, to fight through there to take the Munda airfield. And that, was, that Munda airfield was started by the Japs. And uh, they did have a few airplanes there, but uh, when we captured it, it took us uh, a little less than a month to capture the airfield. And uh, we had, uh, lo that whole month was tough, tough fighting. I know I, I uh, was on a patrol once, and by the way, I was strictly an infantryman. And uh, the, uh, I, I was with the, uh, a patrol of seven people, including me and my one of my sergeants, and uh, we we got caught in an ambush. And uh, of the seven, four were killed immediately by machine gun fire, and uh, my captain was was badly wounded, and uh, myself and my sergeant were the only ones that weren't hit. But uh, he and I rescued our captain and gave him first aid, and he was badly hit. But we got him to the to the regimental medics, and uh, but he only survived for uh, two nights. And then uh, the the Japs uh, ran through the uh, medical aid center, and they killed about 35 patients and some other soldiers. And uh, he this captain of mine got killed. I, he was uh, badly wounded, he couldn't do anything, and he, it ended up he was bad at it. And uh, that, uh, that fighting went on 
on other smaller islands after we took Buddha, and uh, we were we were troubled with air Jap uh, bombing on the airfield and upward our, our areas. The uh, the weather w- was always bad. It always rained at night or even during the daytime. The heat was oppressive. Uh, we'd be moving through swamps and. Next thing you know, you had leeches all over you. Those are horrible things. They, <laughs> the, the way we treated them was, if a guy, I, by the way, never smoked, but uh, I'd have always had friends that did. We, when you got a leech on you somewhere, they'd put their cigarette butt against the back end of the leech and he'd pull out. Otherwise, the head would come off and you'd get an infection if you just tried to pull them off. Uh, there was... Uh, we had many, many casualties on New Georgia, and uh, they, uh, the Jets were, were very hard fighters. They, uh, we had to admire them as to the way they fought to the death. And you, uh, you assaulted an area, and uh, they wouldn't give up unless they were dead or so badly wounded they couldn't move or something. Some of them would commit Harry Carey, that they, what they called Harry Carey, was putting her grenade, a Jap grenade, by the way, they had to tap it on their helmet to ignite it, and then they would put it against their chest and kill themselves. That, I saw that happen many times. And uh, we, uh, we were on New Zealand until early 19, I mean on uh, New Georgia till early 1944. And then we had been in the island for about 19 months. We, we were, uh, the whole division moved down to New Zealand. And um, we, we, uh, we landed in New Zealand. Uh, it, it was about a 10-day, 12-day trip from New Georgia down to, uh, to the, uh, New Zealand. And my battalion, which was the 3rd Battalion of 169 Infantry, uh, we didn't move with the division. They shipped us up to an island called Vela La Vela, uh, which we stayed there, and we stayed there for about a month. And then we went, we were the last unit to get back to New Zealand. But uh, when we got to New Zealand, we had uh, two weeks of uh, vacation time, and half the command could leave. When they came back, the other half would go. And then we started intensive training, long marches. But the island, uh, New Zealand, was absolutely beautiful country. Beautiful weather, uh, rained occasionally too. And uh, we went on maneuvers in an area of Rotorua, which was uh, uh, run by the Maoris, uh, who were the native people of New Zealand. And uh, they were a very, very nice uh, people, they, uh, they they were treated uh, very very well by the uh, the English branch of the population uh, there in New Zealand. From uh, New Zealand, uh, we cranked up to go to New Guinea, and if if uh, New Georgia was bad. Nicholas P. Grecke of Avon, Connecticut, served in the U.S. Coast Guard during World War II. Just after Pearl Harbor, Grecke enlisted in the Coast Guard as opposed to the Navy at the urging of a friend and has zero regrets about the decision. Grecke was stationed in the Pacific Theater and participated in the Battle of Iwo Jima and the Battle of Okinawa aboard the USS PC-469. In the following clip, he shares what it was like to be at those battles as a member of the Coast Guard and the pivotal role they played. So now you're on your way to Iwo. Can you describe the the convoy's trip to Iwo and, and uh, all I remember is that the uh, the Missouri was with us. Okay. You know, and the two other battle wagons and some, and I don't remember the name of the other battle wagons or and the, some their cruisers with us. And they got there just before we did, and they just pounded the living daylights out of that island. And I remember that Missouri firing over our head as we are up off the, off the coast of, uh, rather about uh, probably a mile or so off the coast of um, Iwo. And you'd see a, ye- a yellow smoke 
and you could hear that salvo go right over our head and you could hear that sucker hit and holy cow what a crater you'd see going oh my god you know but um that was really something yeah so how many days did the bombardment uh, go on? They, they must have been at it three days before we brought the landing, the, the, the Marines there. Yeah. Oh. And then we, uh, one morning, we we told them to get up at the line of departure. And that's, we looked back and here in the first and second waves are coming in, you know. And our job was to, uh, to, to uh, what? If they need help, to help them out. If they, if they they're being uh, bombarded by someone, or the mortars are dropping, and they tell, give us our range, and we pump shells, and we're as close as a thousand feet off offshore. Okay. Yeah. Wow. In fact, I remember one morning we uh, a mortar hit, and two of us were standing. I don't know how I ever got out of this. I was just crap luck. Hey, eh? the mortar dropped between us and the guy next to me got splattered and I just got a little bit of shrapnel in my leg and I, I don't know how I ever got out of that thing. I, uh, Did he survive? Yeah, yeah, but he was all beat up. Holy cow. I said, holy cow. Yeah. I mean, you say to yourself, it just wasn't my number, but uh, but we were there for about EWO for about uh, three, uh, three weeks or so and when they they needed, they needed help. There was, on Mount Sabachi, they had an enormous tunnel there, and they were shooting down at us. So they sent us in to, to pepper the suckers out of there, you know. And we were off there uh, about a thousand feet, and just shot up at them, and they were shooting down at us. And they were shooting at you. Yeah. 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 And when the first flag went up, all the, all the horns went off, you know, boop, 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 you know, and we all, yeah. But I, I didn't really know much about the second uh, flag or anything like that. You know, you, you're busy and there's so much going on that you just not you just haven't got too much. I understand we were involved in it though, but right. you know that's just about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, the Coast Guard supplied the second flag, yeah. which was a larger flag, and that was the uh, the one that was shown in the, uh, mm. the famous Joe Rosenthal photograph. But the sad part of it all was that the Japs had all their guns zeroed in on the beach all their mortars and they did absolutely nothing until the marines landed and when the second wave hits holy cow everything went off and that that whole beach was an absolute bloodbath you know you could see it you know you could, uh, yeah so you, you could ah crap so things weren't going well absolutely disgusting and we helped them out but you know you can only shoot so close to them you know but it was really a but inch by inch as more waves come in, you know, yeah. they, uh... Did you want to use this at all? Did oh, sure. We, uh, we worked with the 4th Marine Division, and we went in on a red beach. Beach oh, is... A little higher, Nick. There you go. Okay. Put it off to the side and talk. Okay. This way? Yeah. We went in... Uh, the, the beaches were by colors. They named them by colors. And we... And we went in, uh, we brought them in on a red beach, which is right okay. there, yeah. And of course, Mount Savachi was over here, yeah. Right. Um, but holy cow, Red Beach had an awful time. The 5th Marines went in under Mount Savachi, and they, they really got clobbered there you know, when they first went in, you know. The, uh, Yeah, I, I understand that the, the Japanese yeah. held off until the Marines yeah. were on They the were beach something. And, and they were they were dug up all over and dug in all over, you know. Um, you never know where they were going to come up, where a tunnel was going to come up or what rock was going to be moved and they were behind it. And uh, it was really, really tough. I felt so sorry for those guys. Now, was there air, air power? Were, were planes coming in? Yes, and, and yep. Were they coming off carriers? They were coming off carriers, yeah, Navy, Navy, okay. uh, yeah. Um, but holy cow, uh, I don't remember seeing any suicide planes uh, or on Iwo. Uh, yeah, that hadn't started yet. Yeah. Right? Okay. Well, yeah, it started in the Philippines. But, in the uh, Philippines. Yeah. yeah. So we were there three weeks helping out, doing what we can, evacuating and whatnot. 
And then we were sent down to a lady in the Philippines. And we were getting ready to hit Okinawa. Uh, Do you remember uh, back to the, the raising of the flag in a very uh, special uh, photograph that it was, the most famous photograph of, of World War II. Do you remember when you first saw Joe Rosenthal's photograph, uh, the, the final copy? Did I don't think I've seen it until I got back to the States. Yeah, I yeah. guess I heard that from, yeah. from veterans. Yeah, we so. never seen anything. So you were you were there when it happened, yeah. but you didn't see it till. Uh, Rosenthal got it in Iwo, or Okinawa, you know, we... Uh, he got hit by, oh, we'll, we'll go into that when we get to okay. Okinawa, yeah. Yeah, Rosenthal, okay. Mm -hmm. But I know that uh, it's just special that the Coast yeah. Guard uh, was involved mm -hmm. in the raising. I know, and everybody thought the Coast Guard was, uh, they just hanged around the coast and whatnot. They did, actually, in some places, but they they were on LSTs, they were on destroyers, and uh, they, they did their part, because they're all into the Navy, and the Navy took credit for it, but... Uh, well, Still, we had that. Yeah. I must admit, I guess I thought the Coast Guardmen walked the beach with the yeah. and looked out to sea. And, yeah. the, and the research I've done for this interview has uh, uh, gave me a whole new uh, perspective on uh, the Coast Guard's involvement. So, but I don't regret. I don't regret um, joining the Coast Guard. Yeah. yeah. Now, did you tell us way back when, uh, at the beginning of the interview, why you chose the Coast Guard? Or well, this friend of mine decided I was going to join the Navy. He said, let's try the Coast Guard. Yeah. We joined yeah. the Coast Guard. Yeah. 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 But I, as I say, I don't regret it. It was yeah. a good experience. Well, it says he, uh, the reading I've done says the lar it was the largest operation of the Pacific yeah. War. It oh, it was. There was... When we had come, when we went left Lady, we had a convoy. I've never seen it that big. I mean, there were hundreds of ships. Well, it says here, in late March 1945, nearly 1,300 yeah. ships began yeah. the largest operation yeah. of the Pacific War. So yeah. that's, that's a lot of boats. Yeah. Boy, oh boy, I tell you. So um, they didn't have any resistance going, not with, not with the Army. I don't know what the Marines, how they laid out up the upper part of the island. But they didn't waste too much time in sending it. And we were being bothered by suicide planes. Yeah, that's my, my next question. Is, yeah. uh, the, it says that, uh, the Japanese assembled 120,000 troops. Yeah. But they also prepared with suicide training for hundreds of aircraft, small yeah. boats, and human torpedoes. So can you tell yep. us about that? Well, they, uh, they had suicide boats. In fact, um, well, uh, we were on the outer screen, but we were patrolling off Japan, you know, to stop these uh, suicide planes from coming in. Uh, they just soon lose a small ship than they would, uh, you know, a larger ship, you know, and hospital ships and and battle wagons and everything. So we were out there for days, and we uh, our charges. And you got two battery. You got two chargers, uh, generators on your ship. That's what I want to say. And ours weren't working for it. Usually when one generator's down, they work on the other. And we were having problems with it. So a lot of ships had to anchor out. And you didn't have a, you know, a, a harbor to walk into or rather to sail into. And we were about three miles out at sea. And we dropped our anchor. And we were working on our on the generators. And this was at nighttime. And all of a sudden we, uh, we uh, heard three... Looked uh, looked on back aft or rather, uh, or off our depth charge or our, our stern, and we uh, we could see these three boats coming at us. You know, these were three suicide boats, and um, so we had to get our ch uh, generators going so we could get our our guns broadsides. They were coming back. They were coming dead aft. You know, so they they knew they had to. They, were, they knew that that they are, they, to come dead after, they'd probably get us. So we finally got it going, and and I think the, the last one we, uh, these 20 millimeters, got them about, um, about probably a thousand feet offshore, one blue, that's the last one, yeah. And they were loaded with uh, an explosives, holy cow, I mean, when they, when they hit, uh, wow, everything went up, you know. We got the spray and everything from it, but boy, we were lucky. 
and they were going for our, our uh, stern, which is, we have ash cans, or rather, dev charges. Sure. And you know, it's 300 pounds of TNT in each dev charge. And we would have gone sky, I'd still be flying. Hey, uh, and we had something like 75 aboard somewhere around there. What were these uh, suicide boats? How many How many people were on them? There was just one, one, one guy, yeah. and, and were they... And it was about a 14 or 16 footer. Okay. Yeah. Packed with explosives. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right up in the bow. So uh, they also had suicide swimmers. I understand that. So that you know, all the Did you ships. I would know. We we had a we uh, heard a lot about them, and one got hit out. One transport got hit out there. So everyone had to anchor out, you know, and everything was brought out, brought in by you know, these Higgins boats, you know, yep. these you know, surprise and their uh, the supplies and uh, the evacuees and everything. And. Um, yeah. So we were somewhere around there, two and a half, three months uh, patrolling off of Japan, and our, our, and we seen an awful lot of destroyers and ships get hit. You know, um, they would come right out, out of the sun, and uh, every morning, you know, in the nighttime, right out of just before the sun sets. And uh, holy cow, they would come at you, and uh, I, I think I seen one ship, one destroyer, get hit by five. In all hands, you know, and look, there are 300 and some odd men on a destroyer, on a DE, you know. And uh, we, we, there, I read that um, when we got back, that 52 uh, ships were lost off of off of Japan by stopping these these suicide, suicide. planes, you know. Wow. And that, and that's a that's an awful lot of men going down. And uh, holy cow, you know, you you say to yourself, well, how lucky were we, you know? Uh, but um, but as you say, they were going after the larger ships yeah. uh, to make uh, some of them got hit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, <clears throat> but they they just wanted the the big ships and they, you know that's, and the transports. <clears throat> that's that's where all the damage was and the transports and the, the aircraft carriers and. Uh, so how far off Japan were you? You, uh, you know, we never hours, seen land. Close. Yeah, okay, we were we were probably about to what. Three or four miles off of Okinawa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And our job was to, um, just as soon as we got sub uh, just as soon as we, <coughs> excuse me, just as soon as we got uh, contact on the radar, we'd, we'd radio right into the, you know, shore, and here they come, you know. And our job was to stop them. Thank you so much, Brian and Jillian. That was excellent. In World War II, members of the armed forces were generally on active duty for the duration of the war. For many, this meant being away from home for four years or more. Keeping up the morale of the troops was crucial. Much of that work was done by the USO with well-known performers such as Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, and Marlena Dietrich. Another popular entertainer was Glenn Miller, who was commissioned as a captain in the Army Air Force in 1942. He performed in many USO clubs in the United States and created the Army Air Force Band. In 1944, he and his band arrived in England. They performed over 800 shows, and tragically, Glenn Miller was lost in a flight from England to Paris in mid-December 1944. While Glenn Miller was gone, his music was, will never be forgotten. And performing his most popular piece, I'm delighted to introduce to you the Connecticut National Guard 102nd Army Band playing in the mood. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. At the end of February, Lieutenant Colonel Frank Tantillo was given the name of John Cerulic, a 101-year-old Middletown native who served in World War II, with the thought that he might be interesting to connect with. Frank passed along the contact information for John's son, Tony, but we were unable to connect before the pandemic hit and put everything on hold. Fortunately, John's daughter-in-law, Leslie Cerulic, came across the message and called me at the end of October. When she spoke about her father-in-law in such glowing terms, it was obvious to me that we needed to include him in our program as one of the oldest living Connecticut veterans of World War II. Tony and Leslie recently interviewed John, who served uh, in an artillery unit that was part of the 37th Ohio Buckeye Infantry Division, and we are pleased to bring you part of that interview. Our featured interview is John Cyrillic Sr. from Middletown, Connecticut. John just celebrated his 102nd birthday just a few days ago, and we are fortunate to have been able to interview him regarding his experiences in World War II. John registered and enlisted in the Army as part of the Selective Training and Service Act on December 5, 1941, just days shy of the U.S. joining World War II. When his draft number was called in January of 1942, he was assigned to the Artillery Division of the 37th Ohio Infantry Division, a part of the National Guard Infantry Division of Ohio. John eventually earned the rank of T-5 in the U.S. Army, serving in the South Pacific Theater. The following clip details some of his experiences in the Fiji Islands. So was Fiji the first island you went to? The first island, we went to Auckland, New Zealand, okay. then the Fiji Island, okay. where we got all our training after the Japanese built the airstrip for 
our fighters to come in. <clears throat> well, the Japanese didn't build the airstrip. Didn't the Americans build the airstrip? No, the, the, they built a strip for the fighters to come oh, in. Oh, the Japanese, so you took over their airstrip? Yeah, that, oh. that, that's what we're waiting for, for them to get it built up. So we all had, we went up there the first day we, I landed there, a Japanese came and it was a bomber, <laughs> with the bombs. But we all ducked, they dropped a bomb some other place, not where we were. We had a, I was stuck on details on the beach, clean the beach. We had to clean the beach as fast as we could, take everything off the beach and hide it so the Japs wouldn't see it. So after all... So they didn't know you were there? Huh? They didn't know you were there? The Japanese didn't know you were there? Because you took everything off the beach? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They we, they knew that we we come in. Uh -huh. The Marines and the Army made the beachhead uh, first. And we, I call that, we stay there. We stay in Guadalcanal. And that's where we found out how to fight jungle fighting. It was not that good so this one ship come in and unload another one down the ropes we went and had to climb on on barges and that it took us in uh let's see yeah we stayed on guadalcanal guadalcanal today is a was a base station everything came to guadalcanal all the ships come in with supplies that came there. So that's where you took your training was on Guadalcanal? Yeah, we took our training on Guadalcanal. And then from there, where did you go? From there, we went to, Bo uh, what's that, <laughs> another island. Bougainville? We went, huh? Bougainville. Bougainville, yeah. First, we had to, had to clean up seven islands before we went to another island. Every time we clean up an island, we went back to Guadalcanal for new equipment and the rest. And another week, we go get to another island. When we clean all that out, we went back to Guadalcanal again. That was our base in Guadalcanal for new clothes and the guns and ammunition. Until we got all seven islands all clear up. Then we, from there, we stayed there. We went to Bougainville. Board the ships, a whole, about five ships were in the bay. We all went aboard that. We went to, on the way. We didn't know where we were going, but then they told us we're going to Bougainville in another jungle, all woods. So we all got there, off the, on the ropes, down the rope ladder. We climbed in, and we went in there, and that's where we found out we had to have more water. Water was a big problem. You could go without eating, but you couldn't go without water because it was so hot out there. And so we we stayed at at the uh, island for a long time. Thirteen months we we lived on there. I spent two birthdays there. So then the ships come in, a bunch of ships come in, and we're back on the ropes. I'm glad to climb the <laughs> on a the rope ladders us on board the ships, and off we went. We didn't know where we were going, but we were going to the Philippines. That's where we are on our way to the Philippines. But before we got there, they split our outfit on two, sh we were on two ships. I was on one ship, and the other part was on another ship, because they didn't want to lose all our troops. So I, we got into the Philippines. They, they, they unloaded the first guys, first ship of our. I was still aboard the ship on the second ship. I didn't go and get, I didn't hit the the down the fill up there. So, uh, and that's, uh, I didn't get there the second day I got off the ship. Had to find my alpha. They were three miles already inland. We had to look for them. So slow by slow, we found this one of our trucks going by. We waved him down and he took us back to the outfit. That's how we got back to the outfit and this for the second day. Uh, let's see. It took us some quite a while to get down into Manila. 
we were there. Yeah, it took us a little while to get to Manila on our way. We're on a main highway. We were lucky. We had tractors and we, instead of trucks, to, you could hear them coming down a long ways. And at that time, I was a machine gunner. I had to go way out in the front of the field, make a perimeter until the outfit came in with the four companies. We all, our machine gunners were out there. So when they got there, then we moved along. We moved pretty good, pretty fast until we got Manila. When they got into Manila, they cleaned that all up. I didn't see any enemies at all, nothing. But we had, we were doing a lot of firing there uh, on the island. When it was all quiet, we had to turn around and we only uh, reached a half of Philippines. We got it. We had another half to go to our parish. So off we went. We were going back the other way, going for our parish. We were in the woods. There's only one road to go that way. We were on the, on the road there. The, the captain got up one morning and told us that's when the, it was all over. They gave up. So, so I only had 85 points. Who had 86 points were the first ones on the first ship that was there. They went all aboard the first ship. Had 86 points and more. Because they're all national. I was with the National Guards from Ohio. And they all went home. The only army we had was the National Guards. Nothing else. And they they all went home. I had to wait for another ship to come in for some time. What other islands did you go to? Huh? What other islands did you want? You were, you were in the Philippines and you were Fiji. But in Bogoville, what other islands did you go to? Where was it that your brother There's, came to see you? That... Oh, that was well, Bougainville, Philip, uh, Eddie saw me in Philip, we were in that island. Uh, we were there for 13 months. Oh, and what, how did that happen? How did your brother find you? Do you remember? He, well, he said he went to the Red Cross. He knew I was there, but he went to the Red Cross. Did you know he was there? No, I didn't know. Okay. I didn't know at all. My brother come up, yeah. He come up and he, when they say him coming up to the, on the trail, they knew he was my brother. So I got up, they told him I was up there in the tent sleeping. Because I was on duty all night, so I had daytime sleeping. Everybody came up into the, uh, to the tent. I couldn't believe it when he woke me up that, <clears throat> that he was on the island. Yeah. So, was that the only time you saw him? Or did you get no, he was with us all the time. He was an engineer, yeah. Uh, yeah, and the guys know him. He, he had a, a 21 ton bulldozer. He, he was an engineer and he lost two of them in the end of water. He didn't make it. And he didn't make no roads at all. He was supposed to make the roads and nothing doing. He lost he, the bulldozer. He lost that bulldozer. I saw her one, but I didn't see the last one. But the Navy had to come and get that one out because their boats were hitting the, the thing and smashing up. Where you lose them? In the water. In the water? In the bomb hole. He ran into a oh. bomb hole. He couldn't, the, the, the ship couldn't bring them in and it couldn't get off. So the top water went up and drowned the thing. So what did you do when, um, when the war was going on? Did you have to shoot the, the big gun or anything? Yeah, we had to, I was the number two man loading that 105 Howard, sir. Yeah, they gave me the bullet that was that one there. That, that was that shell. That was weighs forty two pounds. It does. Yeah. And now, how far were you up at the front lines, or were you, did you shoot the gun from from far back? Far back. Yeah. From far, far back. Yeah. But uh, I volunteer twice. They need help on one of the islands, so they wanted some help out there. So, so they needed a volunteer and 105, one man from each outfit they only want. Oh, okay. That's about all. So the truck driver knew where we had to go. Okay. He got the guy and then the Navy picked us up 
took us from one island to the other island. And that's and he took us all the way down the front line. We got in the front line, I hollered to the infantry, artillery's ready to fire. And they said, holy a fire, we didn't have to fire that time. But then as I looked around, I told the guy, I said, don't move. I said, look, all the landmines, the whole thing, how lucky we were. They're all, the, I said, don't move. Look, all the landmines are here. So, so. Did someone come in to remove the landmines so you could leave? Huh? Did someone come and take the landmines out? No, and how no. did you get out of there? We just backed up and got the gun, the truck come up. We hooked the gun up on our truck. And off we went back, uh, coming back. Wow. But we had a, the Navy wouldn't take it. We got back to the shore, but it was five o'clock, the Navy stopped. There was no Navy on the water, and we couldn't go up. We, we were stuck on, the, on that one island. The whole, uh, quite a few soldiers were there. Had to sleep on the ground till the next morning. We had to wait for the, Navy to pick us up and bring us from one island to the other. Whatever island we were on, we were off. But uh, every night at, at, at five o'clock, they all stopped. Nothing moved. If you moved, you was gone, yeah. That's how the Japanese could see you? Yeah, they didn't see me. <laughs> they didn't see me, no. So when you, you went from island to island to clean up after the sh uh, after the shells were shot and everything? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We went out there. Uh, and you brought something home from the war, right? Yeah. Is this what you, is this what you used yeah, to pick yeah, up? Yeah, and the bullet was on top. They come like that and bullet by itself. And this one here, it was fired on my birthday. Just... Mm -hmm. We only fired three rounds that day, so we had a fellow do that, and we it's had that, time. yeah, we had that, that was on my birthday, only three rounds we fired that day. And that, that shell is engraved with what? What's on there? Uh, all, uh, gun the, my, my gun crew. Your gun crew. My gun crew. We had, we had four guns. Mm -hmm. We have four guns in there. That was the third gun. Yeah, I had a third gun. I went into that uh, that crew with that crew and worked. And how did you get that home? Well, I got home. Well, we had 86. Another ship come in, and I had 86 points. So I, they took us to Perry's where they, they landed. All right, so did you, did you have to hide that? Oh, I had it. Nobody saw that. I had that all wrapped up. I had the casing for it. I didn't know what the casing is. Thank you so much. To our audience, thank you for joining us in commemorating the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II through our program, Remembering World War II 75 Years Later. We were only able to provide a sampling of the many interviews conducted by the CCSU Veterans History Project and would encourage you to do your own search through the fascinating collection of oral histories photographs and other materials from World War I to the present, all major conflicts are represented. You can access the collection through the CCSU Veterans History Project website under Search the Website. Thank you so much to all who made today's program possible. As the listing of all those involved in our program is displayed, the 102nd Band will play its final number, the Armed Forces Melody.
reality.